Warning, the following podcast features views and opinions that are likely to trigger the extreme fanboys and fangirls who disagree with them. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Hot Takes with Bill Gaze. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to all of you who showed up at LA Comic Con for the series premiere of Reboot It with the guys from the Nerd Goat podcast. If you're wondering where you can listen to that, hang tight because we will have information. You can follow me at Billy A. Patterson. You can follow them at Nerd Goat Podcast, and we'll let you know if you couldn't make it where you can hear that. But today, we are talking about 2005's Fantastic Four, Marvel's first family, and joining me is a part of my family, the Kiss family, the Kiss army. Uh, please welcome uh, Greg Troyan from the Lipstick Panel. Greg, thanks for joining me, man. Hey, thank you so much for having me in your wonderful abode. That Gene Simmons axe in the background is uh, very beautiful. I'm a little bit jelly, a little bit jelly, <laughs> not going to lie. Yeah, what uh, what people can't see is my my Gene Simmons axe base. It was the first uh, kind of like just yeah, I just got a paycheck when I moved out here, and I was like, you know what? I, this is obviously in my twenties. I'm like, I don't need to eat. I could just uh, buy a Gene Simmons axe base. Why not? Who needs to eat when you can buy Kiss merchandise? <laughs> That's what I said. Uh, but we're not here to talk about Kiss, believe it or not. Even though we should be. Uh, this this movie, by the way, I think could have done with heavens on fire as part of the soundtrack, but we'll get into that. Uh, we, are, uh, we are talking about 2005's fantastic four. And as always, let's talk a little bit about how this came to be before we get into talking about the movie itself. Fantastic four is kind of one of those weird ones because I think everyone kind of knows um, that in 1994, there was that Roger Corman Fantastic Four that was made purely just to keep the rights going. I don't know if you have you have you had a chance to see it. It's been it's made its way around conventions and bootlegs. That's the one I, I haven't seen. I did binge all the other ones in preparation for this podcast, but that one I have been able to find. Um, I'm not as good at bootlegging in my old age. You know, the internet's <laughs> made me lazy. I can stream everything and pay for everything legally. So I have I still have not seen it, but it's on the list. Yeah, it's definitely one of those weirder movies. You know, like I said, you put Roger Corman, you put that name on it, and you kind of already know the quality that you're going to get because he was infamous for making kind of those B movies on a shoestring budget. But they, they really just made it for $5 million purely for producing the rights. And that's kind of, that's where it, it, the Fantastic Four kind of stayed there for a while. Then it was in 1995, they hired Chris Columbus, who did a lot of kids movies. I think he might have done either Night at the Museum or one of those Harry Potter movies. He did the, I think the first two Harry Potters, which, uh, yeah. hot take, those are my favorites of the bunch. Uh, oh boy, the Harry Potter episode coming soon, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, so they they were trying to get Fantastic Four for a couple of years. They even brought in uh, Sam Hamm, who you may remember did the script for 1989's Batman for Tim Burton. Uh, this was kind of, it, it went around for a couple times. Um, Simon Kinberg, who I think would later be attached to the 2015 Fantastic Four, did a pass on it. So it was really, this is one that they had a hard time getting off the ground a little bit but then 2005 rolls around and 2005 i don't know if you remember that was that was a big summer for movies we're talking star wars episode three revenge of the sith batman begins uh tim burton's charlie and the chocolate factory which in hindsight wasn't very good but it was much anticipated at the time steven spielberg's war of the worlds and then there was Fantastic Four, smack dab, July 1st, 2005. So I want to ask you, did you see this movie when it came out? Do you remember anything about it when it was first coming out in 2005? Yeah, I was I was 15 at the time. I was born in 90, so it's really easy to remember what age I was each year. Wait a minute, uh, wait so a minute, you, wait a minute. You're talking about you're too old here, and you're younger than I am talking about it. <laughs> well, no, what I'm saying is it's easy for me to remember years. It's just, you know, born on an even year just makes it always easy to know exactly where the pinpoint thing so yeah 15 years old um i was obviously more excited for batman begins like oh wait rachel ghoul in a movie sure yeah, yeah i'm down for that 
But um, I was a big uh, Fantastic Four fan as a kid. Watched the cartoon. My dad had a bunch of Fantastic Four comics. And I went to see the movie in theaters with my dad. And I loved it. Because like, wow, this was really faithful. Neat. I liked this. Doctor Doom was a little bit weird, but otherwise pretty solid movie. Yeah, I think what's interesting about this. Well, first of all, we should say that uh, currently on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 27 percent score from critics and a 45 percent audience score. So I think it's fair to say that most people did not like this movie. Um, I'm with you. So I remember coming out of Batman Begins and I kind of felt I was I was sad by Revenge of the Sith, not because I didn't like it. Opposite. I loved it. But I knew at least at that time that was the end of of Star Wars. And I was like, okay, it's kind of sad to see it go. And then Batman Begins comes and it's like, okay, but, you know, uh, every new beginning is some other beginnings end. something new is coming with this Batman. I love it. Uh, And I was kind of riding that wave of momentum with Fantastic Four. And I kind of feel like Batman Begins is not the right appetizer for a main course of Fantastic Four. Because now, like, you know, it's hard to I think Fantastic Four exists in this happy little bubble and to watch something that was so grounded in reality and did, you know, whether people want to remember it this way or not, like Batman Begins really kind of reshaped the way that we looked at comic book movies I kind of feel like it was if you flip flopped their release dates, Fantastic Four might have been remembered a little kinder. Yeah, I think it's, you know, Batman Begins was such a a game changer in so many ways and such a masterpiece. And it was the genre moving forward versus Fantastic Four was more where the films were at at the time. Like, it fits in well with the Raimi Spider-Mans and the X-Men's of the day. Like, it is very much a product of its time. It's a little bit more lighthearted and campy and fun, but it's matching the vibe of what the Fantastic Four are kind of supposed to be. They're supposed to be, you know, the first family of comics. They're supposed to be a little bit more lighthearted, whimsical, and fun, and it really captures that atmosphere of the comics so well. Yeah, I I think I'm with you because... uh... You know, one thing that I and we just talked about this on at the L.A. Comic Con panel. And uh, again, you guys will be able to hear that soon. But one thing we talked about with Batman was I kind of now miss this idea of like leaning into the fantastical elements of comic books. And one of them, I say, is like production design. And you're right. Like this does fit into this this status quo or this mold that, you know, like the Raimi Spider-Man, a little less the X-Men trilogy because that was still playing it fairly safe. But I definitely like feel like down the street, you know, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man could be in this world. And that's leaning in to the fantastical. And we got to this place where it was like, you know, with with Batman, it was Gotham City wasn't this this character anymore it was pittsburgh it was chicago and i think i like fantastic four because it's still it's new york but it feels like a heightened hyper reality that i feel like comic books movies have kind of taken a step back from a little bit yeah i think the the way i would describe it is if you know i haven't been to universal in a long time but the Islands of Adventure Marvel section always just had blaring electric guitar <laughs> whenever you were sure, there. Sure, yeah, yeah. And just this over-the-top shred guitar all the time, and that's just the Marvel Universe. It's just sick and awesome. <laughs> and that's kind of the vibe you get from this movie, down to just like the the bro metal soundtrack when uh, Human Torch is uh, snowboarding. Right. Like it just it, it has just this, this sense of just fun and joy. And honestly... It's pretty similar to MCU movies in terms of its tone. It really, it matches that, like, the balance between, like, you know, the comedy fantastical elements of, like, the more recent MCU films where they got a little bit out there. So, dare we say ahead of its time, this film in some ways? Yeah, because I I think you're right, because there is, like, a, there's a levity to this movie. And I definitely think that... For some, you know, especially once you get to its sequel, which, by the way, I feel like this movie, I've said this before about a couple different movies where I really like the sequels. This movie and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, they kind of in people's mind, there's like an amalgamation and a lot of things that they're like, oh, yeah, what about that stupid dance sequence where he's like twisting in a rubber band and in a club? I'm like, no, 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 that's the second one. That's that's actually not the first one, Um, which I think the first one is better than the second one. But they're. 
there definitely is this sense of levity to Fantastic Four. And I think people, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Fantastic Four is and what it should be. And I feel like a lot of people kind of rolled their eyes like, ugh, Fantastic Four was just kind of like a kiddie movie. I'm like, yeah, but Fantastic Four is kind of a kiddie comic. Like, it's a little bit, it's more of like, you know, they're called Marvel's First Family because they were the the entryway for a lot of people into what Marvel comics are. Yeah, and, you know, just going back to, you know, it's, I was listening to your uh, your Superman Returns episode earlier sure. today uh, before you messaged me. And so that was kind of ironic, like, oh, I got a message from Billy. And so uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny, serendipitous, but... The idea that Superman was supposed to be this, like, bastion of hope and optimism, bright colors, like, that's just what the character is about. And so, like, not all comic characters are meant to be dark and gritty. That's not to say that you can't have a great dark and gritty Superman or can't have a dark and gritty Fantastic Four, but if you look at the core of what they are, that's always what they've been. It's always been about, at least for me, it's been about their interpersonal dynamics as a family. It is about a family and coming together and realizing you're stronger as a unit than as individuals. And also just Ben Grimm has lots of angst. That's exactly what I got in this movie. Coming together as a family and plenty of Ben Grimm angst. So it worked for me. Yeah, I think. And, you know, let's talk about Michael Chiklis as Ben Grimm for a second. First of all, I think that's fantastic casting. I, I don't know who else could have done it. Oh, yeah, he's absolutely, I mean, the casting across the board is great, and I will say, you know, before any, you know, hate or anything, Chris Evans is fantastic as the Human Torch, perfect casting, where when I first saw him as Captain America, I was thrown off, because I was so used to him in, like, the perfect score and not another teen movie, where he always just played, like, the bro-y, preppy guy, and so he was, like, for me, perfect casting for the Human Torch, and then, like, him as, like, a wholesome Captain America threw me off. But, yeah, Michael Chiklis as Ben Grimm, he just, he's so good in, like, both the outfit and out of the outfit. Like, he, you know, so much emotion with his eyes and just great comedic timing and really balancing, like, the comedy and angst that you need with this kind of movie. Like, he did phenomenal. Well, I think you nailed when you said in and out of the costume. And I think the costume makes such a difference because this was just on the cusp. I'm actually surprised that they didn't like this was just on the cusp of, oh, just put him in a mocap suit and we'll make it later. It's like they took the time to actually make the thing a fully realized character with this makeup and, and everything that they did with it that I feel like, you know, we saw later on in 2015 that if you, if it's just literal rocks kind of put together in CGI form, it looks off and it looks weird and you miss the human connection of the thing. And I think the thing, uh, Ben is just such a, an emotional crux of this movie. He is burdened by these powers and his relationship with Johnny, who is empowered with these powers. Like I, I love the dynamic between them. And I, some people say that that, you know, this movie doesn't have very high stakes, but I feel like Ben makes the stakes so personal about getting back to what he was that it does. It does, To me, it didn't feel like it wasn't, you know, high, a high stakes situation. I mean, look, not every movie needs to end with a sky beam. Sometimes it's right. OK to just have like a personal emotional story. And the thing is, what this movie does so well is it really captures the essence of the Fantastic Four. And it, it's about, you know, Ben Grimm and his angst of just like, you know, being horrified that he's turned into a monster, but realizing he can use his powers for good. You know, Johnny learning that he needs to like, you know, put his ego in check and, you know, Reed learning he needs to, you know, balance his life a bit more and Sue trying to just keep the family together. Like they nail that dynamic so well, like that dynamic is so true to the comics and it's it's you know there's plenty of great fast-paced comedy like they were always meant to be a funnier comic and so like the the quippy one-liners that's what mcu films are doing nowadays yeah it's so, so it's i think so, sorry to cut you off but i was just saying no, like it's so funny that 
that joke that he does, like you were expecting maybe someone more rugged. And then he quickly turns into Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Like if that happened, like in a movie today in today's comic book, like landscape, like remember when, uh, when Loki turns into captain America in Thor, the dark world, people were losing their minds. Like they were doing this in 2005. And at the time it was like, roll your eyes. But I think like now you're like, Oh, that was actually pretty cool. You know? Yeah, no, this, I, I mean, the only, like, major, yeah, I, mean, I even say it's major, like, the Doctor Doom is the only part of the movie that doesn't completely work for me, but also, you know, his origin is kind of weird, so I understand why they went that way for the sake of keeping the movie snappy and, like, moving with time constraints and such. So let's talk about Julian McMahon as uh, Doctor Doom, because I feel like when you, when you first talk to someone about Fantastic Four, Doctor Doom is kind of where they point their finger and where they say, you know, this movie really screwed up. I don't 100 percent disagree, but I also don't 100 percent agree with that statement either, because I feel like you're right. The the origin story of Doctor Doom is not really that involved. And when people are like, he's the baddest guy in all of Marvel Comics, you're like, that is correct. But also remember where you were in 2005. This was not a, an interconnected Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the things that you wanted to see Doctor Doom do, you can't just start with that in the first movie. He's got to come from somewhere. And was this the best choice? I didn't think it was quite that bad, to be honest with you, kind of like the electricity power. Like it had potential that I th I actually think the sequel did less for him than the first movie did. Yeah, I remember when I first saw it, I was I was disappointed with it as just like a Doctor Doom comics fan. But then revisiting it uh, for, for the podcast where because I always thought the movie was pretty good. And then Doctor Doom was the weak link like. Overall, they still get a lot about his character right. His feud with Reed and just his desire to, you know, be the smarter, better man. And, uh, but his ego getting in the way. Like, they still, they had that dynamic and, like, that, they still kept a lot of the essence of what was true to the character. And so, yeah, they just didn't, you know, have him have specifically magic powers. They didn't have him Doctor Strange it up. But I think, yeah, it works fine in retrospect. I think it's, uh... Look, in a in a post Mandarin world, this is so faithful. So I'm fine with it. <laughs> it's you have to also remember too, and I get it. Maybe, you know, in hindsight, maybe Doctor Doom, although it seems like the most obvious uh choice, you know, like like Joker seemed like the most obvious choice in nineteen eighty nine for Batman. That's the biggest villain. You start with it. But then the second time around, they they held off on Joker because they knew they had to kind of build to it a little bit. And I think with Fantastic Four there's enough going on within the the family that you, you know, Victor Von Doom kind of gets pushed to the side just a little bit. And he's kind of treated like villain of the week in this movie. And I get it. It's just necessity of having to play with the family dynamic. So if he had come in in the second movie, I think maybe it would have played a little easier with people. But as for what he is in this movie, I feel like he pulls it off very well. Like he, he, he gets these powers and at first he's angry with Reed, but then realizes like, I, I literally had the power in my hands and he's just, you know, look, he's a twirly mustache villain, but Fantastic Four is a twirly mustache kind of comic as it was. Yeah. And I think like this, the, the actor, I mean, he does such a great performance with the, the role, by the way, nice Batman shirt. Um, but he, he just, he does such a, a great job. Like the, the, you know, the scene that's immediately coming to mind is the scene where the doctor says, I have to, you know, tell the CDC about this. And he just murders the doctor in cold blood. Like that's a very Doctor Doom kind of scene. Like his progression as a character and him manipulating the Fantastic Four against each other. Like he comes off, you know, as the genius, as the egomaniac, and as the guy who you could see eventually like usurping power of his own nation. Like I, it's... I think it's uh, an underrated performance in retrospect where, you know, we might have been initially upset, like it wasn't magic, but otherwise, I mean, they're pretty faithful to what he's about, you know, going to college with Le Reed, being rivals, like it's all there. Yeah. The only thing that even like, I, I don't know, it kind of, it almost takes me out of it at the very end. It was like the post credits kind of scene where it shows him being transported back to Latveria. And I'm like, 
that it, it almost doesn't fit this version of the character. It's like, what? What's what is Latveria? Why is he this like ruler of this weird country I've never heard of? What does that have to do with anything? And if anything, maybe if they really wanted to like appease comic book fans, they could have laced some of that in throughout the entire movie because it just comes off as like very like the bad type of fan servicey at the end. But if we're talking about the bulk of the actual movie, like, I feel like he plays his part well. I think this is one of those instances where people had built up in their head what something should have been instead of, you know, accepting what was given to them. And, yeah, maybe this isn't the Doctor Doom that you, you know, imagined in your head as a six-year-old. But for this story, I think it works. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's, you know, a big, uh, a very true statement about movies and art in general is you – accepting what it is and then deciding whether or not that works for you as opposed to wanting it to be something else. I'm one of the few people I know who read spoilers for movies before I go to see them because that way I don't get surprised if something happens and like, oh, I don't like it or that was an unexpected turn. So I loved Batman v Superman, but that's because I read all the spoilers before I went in and I knew about the Martha thing before and wasn't shocked by it and just had to be like happy with what I saw on screen or, you know, like I got to make my decision about like it narratively and then seeing the execution. And so this movie, you know, I didn't see it uh, knowing spoilers and was like, ah, oh, what, Doctor Doom, you know, is not right, and this isn't right. But then, if you just accept it for what it is, it's a, it's a fun movie. It's funny, it's fast-paced, and it has a lot of heart. Like, you know, there's so many great scenes, like, you know, as we're talking Ben Grimm's angst, when he uh, is, you know, coming across his fiance for the first time, and she sees him as a horrified monster. That is as classic Fantastic Four as you're ever going to get. Like, that is, you know, down to the trench coat and everything. It just breaks your heart and just, you know, just amazing, amazing performances. Yeah, and that's um, that's Laurie Holden from uh, The Walking Dead. Uh, what was it? Andrea, I think was her name. Uh, but, yeah, that's, it, again, like, they there's enough in this movie that I guess I was surprised by people when they're like, oh, it's, you know, like, they did Doctor Doom wrong. That's not how it is in the comics. It's like... But there's so much that they took, like almost like panel to screen from the comics, like like you said, you know, like the the big trench coat and and all that. It's like, how could you be that upset? Like they gave you what you wanted. I don't know if your problem necessarily is Fantastic Four the movie. Maybe just Fantastic Four the concept just isn't for you. This this idea of a family, you know, an actual family, not like the Avengers or the Justice League. Like these are people that once the job is done, they don't just go their separate ways and call me if something comes up. It's like they go home and have Sunday dinner together. And sometimes that's the most interesting part of the whole story is them just like arguing at the dinner table, you know? Yeah, that just this is all about the character beats, the interactions, just little things like uh, Johnny uh, bringing that thing action figure that says it's clobbering time and, you know, Ben getting upset and smashing it up against the all like this is all about character beats. This is all about how endearing you find the characters and that that's what you get. And like, man, so faithful to the comics down to like the the origin up in space, like incredibly faithful. One of the. This is one of the most faithful comic book movies there is. As as I continue, you know, thinking about it, this is so faithful. Perhaps faithful to its detriment in some ways because it is a comic come to life. Yeah, I will say. So here's one like, I don't know if this is an open criticism or just one maybe like just I have of this movie. Because look, I say every episode, I don't think any movie is a hundred percent perfect or a hundred percent awful, with few exceptions. Um, so one thing about this movie that is kind of like, eh, okay, I think for a lot of it, the production design, like I said, with, you know, the Ben Grimm makeup and everything, like it's really great. I love the Fantastic Four suits. I think those are awesome. I think that some of the set designs are a little, I don't want to call them cheap, but it's like, you know, the, when they're standing on the bridge of, of that spaceship, I'm like, all right, this, this looks a little like Star Trek Voyager to me. It's a, it's a little like made for TV and the Baxter building like is a little underwhelming. They, or at least they certainly don't shoot it in a way that it feels like this is the most technologically advanced building ever, which I think they do actually, it's one of the things in the sequel that they do really well is they kind of upgrade the Baxter building a little bit, but production design wise, like it is very like, 
sound stagey, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. But I think it, it for me, that aesthetic works for the film. I have no issue with that. Like, you know, the, 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 as far as like issues I have with the film, production design is not one of them. I would say the bridge sequence is a little bit awkward because that is the Fantastic Four saving the day from a problem that they caused. Right. Uh, so, you know, people complain about low stakes. If they're citing that scene, that's kind of a legitimate criticism because like, yeah, none of this would have happened if Ben Grimm wasn't like scaring people <laughs> and causing all this chaos on the bridge. Congratulations, you saved the city from yourselves. Which I love that they kind of do that same gag and call it out in Shazam, which I think is is really fun. And in fact, a lot of ways, like I kind of feel like this this is kind of like a spiritual like this would make a great double feature with Shazam. You know, it's like celebrating the more comical and fantastical elements of comics. Like the reason that, I don't know. I just kind of feel like we, at some point, and it honestly, as much as I love the Nolan trilogy, I kind of feel like we took a turn for the worse in some aspects because we almost started taking a lot of this way too seriously, way too personally. And it, it's like, we forgot that at the end of the day, like these are kind of, they're all kind of silly, you know, it's all silly fun and there's morality tales. It's, but it's, you know, I feel like a movie like Fantastic Four kind of highlights like, yeah, this dude can literally stretch his arm like a stretch Armstrong or like, yeah, she goes invisible, which is kind of dumb until she like figures out how to use it for cool things. Like a guy turns on fire and a, a, the other guy's a rock. He's just a rock. <laughs> they, they literally just call him the thing. Like this is all silly and stupid, but in a fun, loving way. Well, I think actually we've gotten a bit of pushback from the dark thing because we're in this era right now where the Marvel movies are getting a lot, not to do the Marvel versus DC thing, but sure. for the for the sake of the point, the Marvel movies are getting a lot of praise because, you know, they've got the humor, they've got the balance, and DC movies have been getting criticized for like, oh, they're trying too hard to be serious and dark, like Man of Steel criticized for being too dark, Batman v Superman criticized for being too dark, and, and you know, there's there's plenty of legitimate reasons to criticize those movies, but I think there's been a bit of a, a pushback against the dark and gritty thing, and now with uh, with Joker out, I think we're actually finally reaching a place of equal equal. Yeah equilibrium uh pardon me for the tongue twister but we're where people are finally i think we're getting to the point where you're like judging each piece on its own sure where it's finally like it's okay to have a world where we have these big campy fun movies like you know spider-man far from home where it's bright and colorful and crazy visuals and you can have a dark and gritty movie like joker and you can love both Right. And I like that we're finally reaching that point. And so I think if a movie like Fantastic Four came out today, I don't think it would be nearly as criticized, especially if it was MCU brand. You know, it might come lower on the rankings. It might, you know, hang up with the Ant-Mans of the world in some people's rankings. But I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be hated. And I think we're, we're reaching that point where people are going back and looking at like the Schumacher Batmans and being like, you know what? They're fun. And like everyone's, I think we're finally reaching that point where there's, like equal scrutiny and equal appreciation. And I like that. Yeah. I, th I think you're a hundred percent right. I think we've, you know, we, we kind of almost mislabeled 2012 to 2018, 19 as the golden age of comic book movies. But I, I actually think we're entering into it right now. And like you said, the fact that within months of each other, Spider-Man far from home and Joker, come out and they're so radically different in tone aesthetics basically every way that you can make a movie they are polar opposites and they're both wildly successful i think that's where we hit kind of the zenith of this of this uh, genre which is variety and i think that fantastic four is one where unfortunately every time it's come out it's kind of like it's just behind the curve of where we're going because if you think about fantastic for this one you know like i said like it came out months after the paradigm shifted with batman begins then it became dark gritty realistic then they were like okay let's do our dark gritty realistic take in 2015 
And it was, it was, you know, like a fart in church because at that point, now we were getting into the Avengers and Ant-Man and this stuff is becoming, you know, like let's, we, we took ourselves too seriously. Let's have more fun with it. So it's like fantastic Four in terms of being on the big screen kind of always feels like it's uh, just a, a hair behind where the curve is. But, you know, if you watch it in a bubble, I, at least this first one, I think there's, there's a lot to get out of it. And, you know, uh, here's a here's a hot take. I think the the first half of Fantastic Four before they get the powers is actually a pretty like decent drama with good character interactions. 100 percent with you. I actually think that up until the what is it like a year later, whatever the title card is, that's like a year later, two one years year later. later. Yeah, yeah one that's year later. where it sinks. That's where it sinks, because up until then, I'm like, ah, this is kind of a cool little body horror movie, a little Cronenbergian, uh, even though that's not to me what what's the DNA of Fantastic Four. I still was like into it and then it lost me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's absolutely not true to what the characters are about, but it was still a good piece of art up to that point. Uh, so, yeah, I would say. I think that movie gets maybe ragged on a little bit too much as being just like an absolute dumpster fire where there's a good chunk of movie that is good movie. And and then, yes, it does become a dumpster fire. But for a while, it's like, man, this is pretty good. Like, Michael B. Jordan just doesn't do wrong by me, so... Well, I think you that kind of like goes back to the point that I made earlier where it's like you're only as good as the last thing people remember. And with Fantastic Four... Admittedly, I think there's so much more wrong with Silver Surfer than there is the first one, but I think a lot of people just remember this movie and that movie kind of squished together and it's it's I don't, I don't it's not fair, but at the same time like I kind of feel like this movie is one where I don't know if people knew what to expect from it, but they just they kind of like I remember seeing this on, on opening weekend. Uh, actually, I think it was opening night. And people walked out like really happy with it. It wasn't until much like till later that I feel like people were starting to be like, oh, it's one of the worst of all time. Like, really? Because I feel like at the time people were really into it. I, I just don't know if people know what they want from a Fantastic Four movie. Yeah, I'd say I remember the vibe of, you know, when I saw it, the people around me, it was generally positive. It did well enough to warrant a sequel. So I don't think people hated it at the time. I think it's just people looking back on it. And I think the last Fantastic Four movie also doing poorly. So because they had, you know, two Fantastic Four movies that people didn't like, they're going back and retroactively being harsher on this one than maybe they were at the time is kind of what I feel. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm with you a hundred percent. And it's just kind of, I don't know. In a, in a, in a, like I said, in a bubble, I think this movie kind of, it kind of is a perfect time capsule of where we were with movies. But I also feel like if this movie came out today, well, first of all, the cast would be a little bit different because I don't think you cast Jessica Alba as uh, Sue Storm. <laughs> Sue Storm. Um, Probably not. I, I don't know. She gets, she gets ragged on as like the worst acting in this movie. And I'm not going to say she's a revelation. But what I am going to say is I don't think that the that the screenplay gives her a ton to do. She, like she gets her moments kind of in the third act. But up until then, it's kind of a lot of like being the prize for either Reed or for uh, uh, Victor. Yeah, they do, they don't. They actually, you know, as someone who just rewatched all of these uh, to marathon for this, they actually give her way more to do in Silver Surfer of just like trying to keep the family together and really being like the mom of the group. And so it's it's a shame because I think she actually did get better with the character over time. But if you're watching this movie in isolation and saying Jessica Alba isn't that great in the role, I kind of get that. Like as far as. As far as criticisms, I get it. You're not wrong, but it's also like you have to remember, too. And I think I talked about this uh, in the Wild Wild West episode. Like, it's not just this movie that did this to this character. Like, this was common kind of at the time that, like, you know, the the marketing executives and, and all the all the suits that come in and they give their notes, they're thinking – only boys are going to watch this movie and only boys are going to want to buy the boy toys. So just kind of keep these women characters to the side. And you see it a lot. You see it a lot in those like nineties and early two thousands movies. I think we've moved past it now, but it took how long until we got like a, a superhero woman, uh, woman movie, wonder woman. It was like 2017. Like 
it took a long time to convince, uh, you know, the people that make these things that we actually want to see those characters. And I kind of think that Sue Storm just in this movie, she's not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but she is used a lot to just kind of push the plot forward as a, and that's not to say she doesn't have some good stuff with Reed, but that's, that's for the benefit of Reed's character arc more than she gets one. You know, when you're doing a, a film with essentially four leads, you know, it is difficult to juggle their arcs. Uh, you know, as someone who, uh, you know, was a big fan of the Ninja Turtles movies growing up, I noticed each Ninja Turtles movie, they kind of let one of them be the lead turtle and get most of the screen time. So one movie, Raphael was the lead turtle. One movie, Donatello was the lead turtle. And then one movie, Michelangelo. And so with this movie, they actually do a pretty good job of balancing out the screen time between the four of them. But Sue does get shortchanged the most of that bunch, where it's actually mostly even, and then she just gets a little bit less than the three of them. Yeah, at I least mean, from what I noticed. I mean, you can definitely track the arc of of Johnny and certainly Ben. I think Ben is the character that we that we kind of see the most change in and, and read to a certain degree. But I really think Ben is kind of the linchpin of of all of this. He's kind of the heart of the movie, but. You know, where does Sue start at the beginning of this movie? It's like she's mad at Reed because Reed doesn't notice her. And then at the end, she's like happy because Reed noticed her. Like, that's not much of <laughs> that's not much of an arc. And it's certainly a super is... empowering film. Exactly. <laughs> like, I, and that's not to bemoan the fact that, like, I definitely think romance in comic book movies is like it's a good thing. Like, it keeps people invested. And, in, you know, as as I've gotten notes on screenplays that I've written, it's like, hey, by the way, girls watch movies, too. Um, and I, I definitely think that, you know, there's something to that. But that's all they gave her. And you're right. In the sequel, they at least gave her. I love her. You know, she has the one story arc that I'm into, which is like how are we ever going to have a normal life if this is what we do? And that seems to be her problem. And it's a problem that like, I guess you could have put in this movie, but it, it would have been a lot. It would have been a lot uh, t- to, to have all these things going on, but giving her something would have helped. I don't know if Jessica Alba, she doesn't have like a ton of range. Like if you look at her IMDb, we're not talking about a murderer's row of cinematic classics, but she certainly, she certainly wasn't given the opportunity to drop the ball, if that's the case. Yeah, it's... I I, I do wish there was more, because I, I saw potential, especially in that second one, but, I mean, an ensemble cast is so hard to juggle. You know, that's why so many movies are not team-up movies. They're focusing on one guy. You know, the X-Men movies focused on Wolverine, because it's easier if you have a protagonist. Having four protagonists, juggling four arcs in that same amount of time is difficult, but I'm impressed with what they were able to accomplish where, and you know, I think fantastic four fans always had now is the thing Ben Grimm, like he's the heart of the team. He's the one who always has the most interesting stories, but like they balanced it out so well with this cast. And yeah, I'm just like, the more I look back at this film, the more impressed I get with it. Yeah, I the plot that I really love, and it's not a huge part of the movie, but it definitely is my favorite part of the movie is, you know, uh, Reed and Sue are kind of rekindling. And even though it's a little forced, whatever. But I love that Ben's like, hey, I'm not I'm not here for you guys. You know, look, if you want to, like, start dating again, whatever, do it on your own time. But you said you were going to fix me. And then, you know, that kind of anger and resentment and then him coming around like, I don't need to be fixed because this is actually closer to who I am and who I want to be than uh, than I was before, which is another thing that I know we're not talking about this movie, but we're, I'm talking about it a lot. But that's another thing that, that actually kind of irks me about Rise of the Silver Surfer is when – you know, Johnny is, you know, he touches someone and he gets their powers and he takes away the thing's power and Ben acts all happy and excited. It's like, well, no, idiot. You know, you could take away your powers if you wanted to. You chose to do that. 
as an act of a heroic act in the last movie. So don't act all happy and surprised this time when it goes away. It undoes the really great choice that your character made in the last movie. Ah, uh, good old sequels that undermine the previous <laughs> film. Who doesn't love those? <laughs> I get it. I get it. It's like a it's like a fun it's like a fun little moment in that movie. And again, if we're talking about isolating things in a bubble, it's like sure that's a fine moment. But it also just kind of it's like I don't know. I kind of I kind of think it narratively and as much as I love that thread, I kind of think narratively it might have been a better choice for this first Fantastic Four movie if. He had been cured like he was, uh, and instead of choosing to go back, like he kind of, he kind of naturally, like it doesn't, it doesn't take, it doesn't, it doesn't stay. And he does go back to being the rock and he has to not Dwayne the rock Johnson, but just a literal rock. And I think, (laughs) I think the fact that like, I don't know, it's a little on the nose that he literally chooses to transform himself. And it also leaves open the door like, oh, if you can transform, just go transform when you have to be the thing. And then, you know, transform back to Ben when you're not. Um, But I like the idea of him coming to grips with it a little bit more when the choice is taking away from him. I think I think it's just too on the nose to make the choice to be the thing. I like more. I think it's more ballsy and risky to come to terms with the fact that he's never going to go back and what he can do with this as he sees it in his mind, handicap rather than like, okay, I'll just choose it. You know? Right. He ultimately, you know, makes the heroic sacrifice to say, I will keep my body deformed like this because I can potentially save lives and do these heroic actions and do things that other people can't. Like he makes the biggest sacrifice out of any member of the team because like they all get cool powers they can turn on and off. He is the one who has to live with that day in and day out. And, you know, that's what makes him such an engaging character across the, you know, the mediums that he's in. But I think out of uh, the different adaptions of the character, this is the best of like following that arc, giving you that emotional payoff. Like this film captures the essence of Ben Grimm better than almost any other media than the original source material. Yeah, and I, I, I truly do love. I, I don't want to sound like the old man. Get off my lawn, but I, I, like I said before, like I love the like they just don't make movies like this anymore where they let, they let the makeup and the costume kind of take over Michael Chiklis, and you can feel that he really becomes that character just by osmosis through putting on all this, all this makeup and stuff. He probably feels as uncomfortable in that suit as Ben Grimm feels uncomfortable turning into the thing, and I feel like that comes out in the performance. And if that comes out in the performance. You know, I feel like that's what drives this movie from start to finish. And I just I don't feel like, you know, when you talk about comic book characters that movies have nailed, I don't understand why, you know, Michael Chiklis as Ben Grimm doesn't land on that list. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I remember reading an interview uh, with Michael Chiklis once, and he was talking about how the suit was so uncomfortable, like they would um, take out pieces of the suit and just like inject air into it so he could breathe a little bit because it was so obnoxiously hot. And so like that's just, you know, being in that suit for that amount of time has to be brutal and grueling. But yeah, I'd say that's that is man. The more I talk about this movie, the more <laughs> I realize how great it is. But yeah, that is one of the top comic book performances of just being faithful to the character and just knocking it out of the park. Uh, you know, it maybe doesn't, it's, it's not necessarily like Heath Joker, uh, Heath Ledger, you know, Joker level, but it is like, it is a great performance. It's just, it doesn't have as much, you know, I think in general with media, if it's dark and gritty, it gets more respect as a, as a piece of true art. Uh, and just, you know, the campier it is, maybe the, like the, the less the art snobs will appreciate it. But, you know, even though this is a light and campy movie, he is doing a great job with the role in the context of this film. And if you compare, you know, across the spectrum of superhero performances, yeah, this is, this is like top tier. Absolutely. You know, one character that we haven't talked a lot about so far, uh, and I'm probably going to butcher his name because it's spelled really weird. I-O-A-N. I'm going to say Ian, although I don't know if that's how you say it. Uh, Ian Grufford as uh, Reed Richards. I had no idea who this guy was before this movie came out. I truly have not seen him in a lot of movies since then. But I I think he nails the the balance between intellectual and just like a dude that you can talk to with 
Reed Richards. Yeah, I'd say also perfect. Like the thing is, when I look at him and see him talk, I think to myself, yeah. This is, this is Reed Richards. This is Mr. Fantastic. He is awkward. He is obsessed with numbers and always trying to, you know, invent the next great thing and bad with business. Like he just knocks it out of the park. And his, I think th- this cast has such great chemistry, the way they all play off each other, like the way that, you know, he plays off with Sue, the way he plays off with Johnny, just, he's very good at, you know, bouncing off them, you know, you know, miss the, the rubber man bouncing off everyone. He does a great job with that. Yeah. There's so many like criticisms I've seen like, Oh God, the effects of, you know, his arm reaching through and just a lot of the thing. I just like, how would you do a rubber band type of, uh, of guy? Like there's no, there's no right way. There's no way you're going to do it where it looks natural and not stupid. Like it's just a right. silly concept on its face. Like at least lean into it and have fun with it. I actually really like when he like puts his arm uh, under the, I think it was in the trailer, like under the door to open the door. And I don't know if classic uh, sequence. Yeah. And, and again, I don't know if, uh, if it's from this first movie or the second one, this is me. See, I'm proving my own point. Cause I've now mashed them together in my head. They're blurring together where he's like, uh, where he's like not paying attention. And then she's like, okay, you have my whole attention now. Cause he, he's, <laughs> she's like mushed his face with the, with the, with the, uh, like invisible kind of barrier. Like, I think, I think there's like physical comedy just inherent and in how stupid a elongated <laughs> plastic kind of person would be like a stretch Armstrong would be anyway. So it's like, again, like, uh, although I, I kind of dug a little bit of the 2015 fantastic four, like the body horror type stuff of it. That's also n- like, that's like an ultimate fantastic four, like a Marvel Knights one-off dark version of fantastic four in reality. Like, a fantastic four like yeah just lean into the silly and stupid because a guy who can stretch is silly and stupid no i want dark and gritty with my man with stretchy powers <laughs> i want it to be dark and serious i want it to be directed by martin scorsese so he can finally respect comic films as art yeah it's just it's just a again like uh, it goes back to what i was saying you know from the very beginning i feel like the people who complained the loudest about this movie are the ones that probably, and I hate to do this. I hate to like my least favorite thing that people say is like, well, you just didn't get it. It's like, that's so dismissive, but I truly feel like a lot of the criticisms I hear, I'm like, well, that's, that's not necessarily the movie. That's kind of just the concept of fantastic four. Maybe you just don't like the fantastic four and that's okay. But a lot of like a lot of the criticisms about tone, about kind of the tongue in cheek humor about the camp, like that's all there, especially in those first, you know, you know, this 60s and 70s Fantastic Four comics that made them the household names that they are. Yeah, I mean, as far as legitimate criticism of the film, Jessica Alba doesn't get that much to work with. I'll give you that. Doctor Doom isn't completely faithful to the comics and the bridge scene is just kind of goofy. There you go. Otherwise, and like oh, some of the production is a little bit dated, which guess what? Technology advances. Uh, some of the movies that look amazing today are probably going to look like trash in 20 years. And we're going to be like, oh, man, I can't believe we thought Avengers Endgame looked good. I mean, like, that's would, gonna people, happen. would people criticize like, you know, Mark Ruffalo's head in the Hulkbuster from Avengers Infinity War or the third act of Black Panther when they're like, oh, it looks stupid. I'm like. My dude, do you know how far we have come in the CGI game? Like, go back to, like, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie or Lost in Space with the little blurp thing that I was talking about a couple weeks ago. Like, it has evolved a lot. Like, you're now starting to get real nitpicky. But I think you're right. With Fantastic Four, it's kind of like that's just the silliness of the comic kind of reflects a little bit in just the production. And I think... I think that's a good thing. The fact that it doesn't feel quite like real New York. It feels like a weird kind of heightened, like fantastical version. Like that's kind of what I want out of a Fantastic Four movie. I want like Fantastic Four kind of should be a kid's movie. 
of, of any of the Marvel properties. How dare you want your Fantastic Four movie to be fun and full of whimsy and heart and family? <laughs> How dare you? Don't you know it's a body horror? <laughs> I mean, it could be. And again, like, that was an interesting choice that they made with the reboot. But, you know, a lot of people, they talk about kind of the turmoil of, of the shoot of that 2015 one and all the behind the scenes drama. But I would postulate they kind of set themselves up with the way that they were going with that. Like, I don't know if the second half of that movie truly would have been that much different, even if Josh Trank hadn't kind of, you know, whatever happened on that movie. I kind of feel like that's where you were going with it anyway. And, you know, that's certainly like, I think all comic book movies and all kind, all of these movies are, I think what makes them interesting is that they are open for interpretation and someone can read it uh, another way. But also it's like, I say that about like Batman or something where it's like, yeah, we've had like 29 different versions of Batman on screen go nuts at this point. But like fantastic four was still kind of like fresh at that point. And so to immediately take it into a dark turn, like I'm not surprised that 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 failed because I kind of feel like that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what makes the Fantastic Four the Fantastic Four. Yeah, I guess so. I I did not read spoilers for that one because I figured whatever, it's a Fantastic Four origin story. I know what I'm getting into. And then it just turned into Elfin Lead. I'm like, what? Uh, okay, this is uh, way darker than I was expecting. Wow, that a lot of people just died on screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can understand why that might not be the one you take your grandkids to. Yeah, and I feel like Fantastic Four should always be something that feels like it should be the most family friendly of all of them. And that's not to say that you can't have uh, darker themes, darker, uh, you know, subject material or heavier things like Empire Strikes Back is rated PG and that's got some of the heaviest, you know, weightiest things in all of Star Wars. But it's still, you know, it's still treated as kind of like, you know, I always say Star Wars is meant for, you know, kind of like the preteens because they're coming of age morality stories. And I kind of feel like Fantastic Four fits in there. That's not to say that adults can't enjoy it. That's not to say that it can't tackle some heavier stuff down the line, but it should always go back to like, if your kid can't handle Blade or the Punisher or even if Avengers Endgame or, you know, or Infinity Wars is a little too much like Fantastic Four should always be like that outlet where more than anything going on around them, it's the family dynamic. And I definitely feel like even though there may have been some missteps in the scripting and the filmmaking of this movie, the family dynamic is first and foremost present in this movie. And for that, I cannot call it a bad Fantastic Four movie. Yeah. And, uh, I completely agree, and I just want to say once again how great Chris Evans is in this. Uh, he, you know, gets flack as being not a great Human Torch. He is perfect casting for the Human Torch in this movie. Absolutely phenomenal. Like, people forget how good he is at playing a cocky jerk. Like, that was what he was known for before Captain America. And I love that they went meta with it to the point of like, you know, like you said, like, look, we have thing action figures and putting all the sponsorships on, on his, uh, on his suit. Like he was, you know, Captain Amazing from Mystery Men. Like I loved like a comic book movie, a, a legit one, not a spoof or lampooning it, but like a legit comic book movie kind of w took that route, at least with one of its characters. Like, yeah, if you got superpowers today, the odds of you being a hundred percent altruistic vigilante in the shadows is slim to none. Cause most of us would be like, yeah, I'll save the world. But can I also like make a couple bucks on, he even says, it, he's like, Hey, what's, what's wrong? Make a couple bucks on the side while we're, you know, while we're waiting for some crime to happen. Like that's, that's a great character. You know, I'm going to get so many more Twitter flowers and now that I can fly through the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you take these amazing powers that you just got and show them off? Especially if you were a hothead before that, is it literal? Like, you know, like, Oh, he's such a hothead. Well, now he's going to become flaming. Oh, he doesn't <laughs> see her. She's now going to actually literally become invisible. Like yeah. Always reaching for the stars. Now he can literally reach for the stars. It's like, yeah. Yeah. All of that is silly and on the nose and stupid. Guess what else is silly on the nose and stupid? The Fantastic Four as a concept. That's why I love it because it's silly and stupid and fantastic. There is a spectrum to art. There is room for both, you know, Bruce Springsteen 
deep, heartfelt, meaningful lyrics. And there's also room for Kiss, where it's just like, we're just really awesome and fun and there's explosions. There's room for both in this world. Not everything needs to be Bruce Springsteen. Not everything needs to be Kiss. Let Kiss be Kiss. Let Bruce Springsteen be Bruce Springsteen. Let the Fantastic Four be the Fantastic Four. You're 100% right, and I feel like I'm not saying silly and stupid as an insult. I'm saying it lovingly because it's like, look, at the end of the day, you know, if a, if, if a child's parents are murdered in front of them, that is a very deeply disturbed individual. And the fact that that person would just put on gray tights and dress up like a bat, it's silly. It's all silly. And yes, there can be very serious things in stories that come out from it. But like, I feel like we've got to stop like deifying a lot of these comic book heroes. And it's like, there is more than the killing joke. And there is more than kingdom come and Watchmen. Like, not all I know maybe that's what you gravitate towards but that doesn't mean that this whole medium was built on the backs of these like Alan Moore you know Frank Miller stories because that's just not the truth that is revisionist history at most yeah and the thing you know that we need to remember especially in this age let's judge everything on its own merits and not saying it has to be like this thing or this thing just like judge it by itself And this Fantastic Four movie is fun, faithful to the characters, makes you smile. Like, it's the kind of movie I could watch with my wife, who's not into superhero movies, or could watch with, you know, my friend's kids if I'm babysitting. Like, you can watch it with your friends, you know, over a couple drinks. I don't drink, but they can have beers and have a good time watching it with me. Like, it's the kind of movie you can watch in almost any situation, And, like, those movies are kind of magical, where it works for kids, it works for adults. If you haven't seen it in a long time, give it a rewatch. It holds up really well. Yeah, I think after now that we've sampled so many types of comic book movies, this one is kind of like, uh, it's a, it's a throwback from yesteryear from a simpler time, and it's, it's fun in its own right. I'm not saying this is the greatest comic book movie ever made or the greatest movie ever made. I'm not saying that these are the greatest performances, but I'm saying, yeah, what you're saying, which is, I think this is a really fun movie. It's, it's judged on merit. Like it's, it's unfairly judged on things that it was never trying to go for in the first place. I think when people said it's too stupid, too campy, too light, well, You got the version that you wanted, and that was a thousand times worse with the 2015 one. So Fantastic Four just has to be graded on a different scale. And I think if you can keep that in mind and really what Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were going for with Fantastic Four, I I feel like this nails it in spades. So, yes, definitely worth another rewatch. And I'm glad that uh, you rewatched it because I loved having your, your opinions on this, Greg, where can the people find you? And uh, tell me a little bit about your band and what's going on with that. Yeah. So uh, you can find me, uh, you find me on Twitter at Greg Troyan. Uh, the band is called lipstick generation. So we host a weekly podcast called the lipstick panel, which we've had a uh, Billy on once got to get him on some more episodes in the future, but it's a, it's a weekly ranking show. So we try to get together a group of people and rank a topic. Uh, usually albums because we're lazy and those are the easiest to consume rather than like, let's watch every MCU movie and rank them, which, uh, we just did that episode and who you're going to, you're going to hate how high Ant-Man ranks on that list, buddy. Oh boy. <laughs> um, oh boy. Uh, but, um, yeah, we, we, we do that weekly as a, as a podcast, but we also uh, have a band and we've released two albums. Uh, we released a bunch of songs reacting to every episode of Game of Thrones less than four hours after they aired. So we wrote and recorded a new song right after each Game of Thrones episode. But our latest single is, uh, is a Kiss related cover for the Kiss fans out there. I assume there's a lot of Kiss fans who love Fantastic Four. There's gotta be some crossover. Hey, the Fantastic Four were in that Kiss comic in the seventies. So there's crossover there. There you go. But, uh, we did a cover of the Eric Carr song, Eyes of Love, just did a video for it. Um, so that's the thing we're trying to promote right now. If you get a chance, hop over to YouTube, look up Lifted Generation, Eyes of Love, you know, do the thumbs up, do the comments, you know, you know how YouTube works, you know how the internet works, you know where, you know how to find the things, look up Lifted Generation, you'll find me, tweet at me, tell me how right I am about this movie, or how wrong I am, or just say hi, let's be friends, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, I, I had a great time, uh, on your show talking about kiss, uh, in the psycho circus album. And, uh, even if you're not a kiss fan, even if you're not a music fan, 
Well, who's not a music fan? That's weird. Maybe you're a serial killer. But uh, th- these guys have a lot of fun talking about uh, really breaking down the way that we break down movies on this show. They they break down albums. And like you said, even going off and doing uh, the MCU. So definitely got to check that out so I can tell you how wrong you are about Ant-Man. Uh, oh, thank yeah, you guys. we're so wrong about Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening. Like I said, last week was the one-year anniversary of the show. And you guys have uh, really grown it from uh, really small to now something where, like I said, we just did that live show at L.A. Comic Con. Uh, You can follow me at Billy A. Patterson, and I will have more info on where you can hear that team up between me and the Nerd Goat Boys, where we reboot Batman for the next generation. Thank you guys so much for listening. Still coming up. Mo Lightning talking solo, a Star Wars story. Hector Navarro coming in to talk D3, the Mighty Ducks, in my opinion, the best Mighty Ducks movie there is. What is what you just said? You'll have to listen next time right here on Hot Takes with Billy Bates.